A fake news story that triggered a major geopolitical crisis. And the effects are still being felt across the Gulf nations more than eight months on. How dangerous are stories doctored to suit vested interests? And what can be done to stop fake news? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Now, in May last year, Qatar's national news agency was hacked. On its pages were comments attributed to the Emir of Qatar, comments that were completely false. But despite the fact that they were made up, they were broadcast by Al Arabiya and other channels. And that led Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Egypt to cut all ties with Qatar. Now, the four countries later handed over a list of 13 demands that included shutting down Al Jazeera, demands that were rejected. Qatar then lodged a complaint against Al Arabiya at the British media watchdog Ofcom, which is investigating the case. Qatar's news agency says it was the inquiry that led the Saudi-owned channel to surrender its licence to the broadcast regulator. Al Arabiya denies Q&A's claim and says it surrendered its licence for business reasons. The channel accuses Al Jazeera of exaggerating the decision to give up its licence, which means it can't broadcast in the UK and the EU. Last month, Ofcom fined the Dubai-based TV station almost $170,000 for airing statements by a jailed Bahraini opposition leader. Well, the man who pretty much brought the term fake news into everyday speech is, of course, the US President Donald Trump. We are fighting the fake news. It's fake, phony, fake. The dishonest media. I called the fake news the enemy of the people, and they are. That was just fake news by NBC, uh, which gives a lot of fake news. Fake news, folks. Fake news. How fake the press can be. Fake news. The news is fake. I'm changing it from fake news, though. D doesn't that undermine... Very fake news. I yeah. know, but aren't you... <laughs> But even some of Trump's own officials have been accused of sending out fake news, like former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. He tweeted a news story tying Hillary Clinton to a child sexual abuse ring with its base at a Virginia pizzeria. The story was proven to be false, but Flynn only deleted it more than a month later. And then there's the case of the tense exchange between Pakistan and Israel. That was in 2016, after a story was shared online. It claimed Israel had threatened a nuclear attack against Pakistan if it sent troops to Syria. Pakistan's foreign minister tweeted to warn Israel that it too was a nuclear state. Israel's defence ministry tweeted back, saying the story was totally fictitious. And in November last year, Sri Lankan police rounded up two dozen people after they were accused of causing violent clashes by spreading rumours that Muslims were going to attack a sacred Buddhist monument. All right, we can introduce our guests now. Joining us in the studio is Mohamed El Masri, chair of the journalism programme at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. In Gdansk, in Poland, we have Tom Law, who's director of campaigns and communications at the Ethical Journalism Network. And via Skype from Naples in Italy, we have Pierre Luigi Paganini, founder of Security Affairs Blog and member of the European Union Agency for Network and Information Security. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Mohamed, let me start with you. We've just had an indication of how serious fake news can be. Does anybody know how much there is out there? Well, one of the problems is that uh, researchers are still trying to kind of catch up with a lot of the data. Um, obviously, publication cycles being being what they are, we you know we don't have a lot of studies out yet on on this phenomenon. But one of the interesting studies that was published uh, relatively recently, just within the last uh, few months, by by a research team, um, was looking at fake news in the United States in the lead up to the American election of 2016 between Trump and and Hillary Clinton. And what they found was that there were 38 million fake news stories shared by Americans in the lead up to the election. Um, 30 million in favor of Donald Trump and about 8 million, 7.5 million in favor of Hillary Clinton. And they go on to surmise 
you know, using sort of statistical analysis based on how many people voted, that it's highly likely that the election was impacted, the election result was impacted by these, by these fake news stories. And one of the problems is, is social media, quite frankly, right? I mean, it's, a, it's kind of a blessing. Sure. It's a blessing and, 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 and it's a curse, but there aren't any filters. There are no editors. There are no gatekeepers. Anyone can act as a journalist and, and share whatever he or she wants. And uh, Pierre Luigi, I can see you nodding at that because the engine, if you like, of fake news is uh, unwittingly or otherwise, of course, the internet. Yeah, uh, I totally share the point of view of the colleague. Uh, basically, you call them a fake news, I call them psychological operation. We are facing with uh, military operations that are managed by uh, governments and uh, the governments use uh, social media. You have to consider that social media uh, was created on the concept of trust. So everyone can, uh, can send this message and can reach instantaneously a huge quantity of people. And it's quite difficult to identify specific actors that are working on, uh, on social media. Uh, fortunately, today we have different uh, methods, we have different means that could help us to identify, to analyze what is happening in specific area, in specific moment, in specific region. We are able to understand if there is a, a specific quantity of people that, for example, are analyzing specific arguments. If someone is trying to push information in order to influence the sentiment on specific discussion. All right. Uh, Tom, uh, propaganda has been around with us uh, since time began, uh, used by governments, used by powerful individuals as well. So what's the difference between propaganda and fake news? Sometimes not very much. And quite often the term fake news is misused, especially by by Donald Trump. As I understand it, it's content which is de created deliberately to mislead and to get people to question verifiable facts um, and, to, uh, and, and to deliberately fulfill perhaps a political or an economic uh, agenda that they might have. Um, some of the, the cases that have been listed were genuine mistakes made by journalists who didn't um, question properly the veracity or the information that they were dealing with. And then the problem was that people not understanding uh, and in government sometimes looking at that information uh, did not ask themselves the right questions to make sure they were actually um, consuming information that could be trusted and not, not, not being uh, critical enough of, of, of that information. So I think it's incumbent on news media to really make the argument and to proactively describe to their audiences why they are different than uh, information that you might find um, on, on social media. And that means, you know, by articulating, this is our code of ethics, this is how we go about doing our job. If we violate these, then you, you have a, a way of correcting us. You can, you can complain. And we have a process which is public and is very clear about how you can go about addressing complaints that, that you might have. So I think it's incumbent on on media as well as through education to actually encourage media literacy so that governments, so that individuals can actually understand what they're consuming and start to tell the difference between what is state propaganda, what is uh, propaganda from, from individual politicians or from other, other interest groups and, and not accept things on, on face value because as we said earlier, the internet means that businesses, that um, politicians can try and communicate directly with audiences and that can be a really good thing but I would argue that we also need good journalism to actually help put into context and to verify that information and to hold power to account. I think, many, I think many would agree with you as well on that Tom. Industry, uh, and also a crisis of trust. Um, and let me, let me bring this to Mohammed now. Mohammed, from what Tom's saying, it sounds very much as though the burden of responsibility is falling heavily upon the consumer and on the journalist, not on the, those responsible for putting out the fake news. I think there's plenty of blame to go around, quite frankly. You know, I mean, you, you, in your introduction, you talked about this, uh, the, Gulf, the Gulf crisis and kind of how a lot of that uh, began. But if we go back to 2012, the United Arab Emirates established, helped establish uh, a lobbying and consulting firm in California called the Camstall Group. And their main purpose was to try and um, uh, plant negative news stories about Qatar in American 
uh, news media. This has been reported by the New York Times, by uh, The Intercept, Glenn Greenwald, and others. And uh, the, by all accounts, they were quite successful. There were many negative news stories about Qatar. But there's an important distinction between, you know, pro you asked about propaganda and fake news, right? So a lot of times governments, take the American government, for, for instance, right? Much has been made about American government propaganda. And study after study shows that American news media tend to, in one way, shape, or form, support the, Amer the official American line. But the American gov government is fairly sophisticated in how it goes about, if we want to use that, yeah, that I, word, propaganda. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody has a certain implicit bias. And, and those biases, if you like, are absorbed as a consequence of, of where you live, where you're brought up, and your own sort of cultural values. Pierre Luigi, can I come to you and ask about this, uh, the, the government component of this? Because it seems very much as though uh, governments not only, of course, have they always forever use propaganda, but they are uh, morphing, if you like, into becoming the major proponents of what could be co co considered as fake news by some on the internet as well. Yeah, basically, uh, every government uses uh, today the social media as a sort of weapon, OK? Uh, they use social media for different uh, purposes. One of these is to try to analyze, to, to, to make intelligence on uh, foreign governments. Another aspect is to try to control, to analyze what is happening inside, inside the, the country, uh, which are the actors that currently are trying to infiltrate some uh, specific discussion, are trying to influence uh, the sentiment of people. So it's, a, it's a very important for any government uh, to have a specific control of social media. So I'm not surprised. So uh, when we speak about fake news, uh, sincerely speaking, I am not surprised. It's something that is, uh, is going on since the birth of the, the, of the social media. So we, we, I'm not surprised. What is very dangerous is uh, when such kind of information is used to try to destabilize uh, another government try to, ah. to create problem uh, yeah yeah that's very 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 dangerous well you and take me you, I... let me let me just interrupt there because you've taken me on to another interesting point that perhaps I can take over to Tom and Tom uh, Pierre Luigi's just referred to to this is you know governments trying to destabilize other governments using fake news or propaganda online um, this year Downing Street uh, the British government Theresa May uh, set up a unit to fight false information that's spread by foreign powers. I mean, how serious is that? Well, that is quite serious, but it remains to be seen, actually, what powers that, that outfit will have. I think that we have to be very careful when looking at a, um, a legislative or, or laws when we um, address issues not just of so-called fake news, but also of hate speech. We're already seeing in, in Germany the so-called... Uh, Facebook law, whereby um, very hastily uh, content which is being um, accused of being potentially hate speech or fake news is being deleted. Now the fines are so are so high that there's a real danger, and evidence is already showing this, that Facebook is perhaps being a little bit too trigger happy in, in what it is removing, because there could very easily be a public interest defence for having uh, content about populist or right wing. Um, or, or dangerous, inf dangerous content on there, so long as it's done in the right context. And it's actually explaining to audiences uh, what this is, how it's being used, and how um, it could be a government, it could be another actor, is using this information in this way to try and change public opinion in some way. So regarding the UK's uh, task force, the jury is out on um, whether that will work and, and what its remit is going to be. It seems so far that it hasn't got much, um, much flesh on the bones in terms of actually uh, how, that's, how that's going to work. But I think we have to be very cautious about finding legalistic solutions to this. Much better that we have, uh, that, that the journalism plays a much uh, more prominent role and starts to actually communicate better why it's important for democracy. And news media have to really reflect on, on what they can do to improve to um, address that deficit of trust. So because Tom, while it's, um, there are some things out of the media's control, um, governments clamping down, media themselves um, also have to, to, to step up in, in this fight for so, so Tom, being legitimate are you, and trusted sources. Are you, are you advocating greater regulation, more regulation? 
No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying we have to be very cautious about more regulation when it comes to the internet. I think we have to find uh, more, more creative solutions than, than creating laws which might be well intentioned to try to protect, protect citizens from uh, misinformation and from hate speech. They can have unintended consequences. Much better that we educate audiences to better question the information that they receive and then they can make better choices about what source information they trust. That's right. not okay, the okay, only Tom. solution, and we're going to have to find no, many other ways of addressing this. That's an but we're already that's an seeing that the legal solution can have negative consequences for freedom of speech. That's a very interesting thought because, Mohammed, of course, the younger generation are much more savvy, are much more sophisticated in terms of, the, uh, of assessing the kind of material that they are confronted with on a daily basis, aren't they? I don't know that we know that. I would say that that's an empirical question, right? I mean, are young people uh, more savvy than, than, than adults uh, navigating this information online? I happen to think that people are really susceptible. I just gave the example about the American election. But those results are pretty, they're pretty frightening, right, to think that there were hundreds of fake news stories and they're, they're shared. And one of the things that the researchers do in this article is they ask people to what extent they believed these fake news stories. And overwhelmingly, people did. They believed these stories, whether they were uh, younger, whether they were, whether they were older. Um, you know, the young generation perhaps you know, has even more of a challenge because they're almost exclusively plugged in uh, online, right, where, where a lot of these uh, uh, you know, news stories are shared. Um, Pierre Luigi, uh, when governments undertake um, campaigns of, of misinformation, shall we say, uh, as Mohammed has already outlined one specific example, they're not doing anything wrong, are they? They're not breaking any laws. No, no, no. Uh, I don't think that they are breaking a law. The, the problem is that uh, they have no means in this moment to, to act uh, in a different way. Okay, the only way is to work uh, closely with the, with the company that operates social networks. Uh, you have to consider that this company, let's think, for example, Facebook, have all the necessary information to try to understand if someone is trying to push in fake news. Okay, so it's not a problem. It's not, in my opinion, it's not a technological problem. Uh, but we we have to consider that there is also another problem, the financial problem, because uh, some company make business and uh, fake news are part of their business. So it's it's very different. Uh, it's very difficult to to take off. The, the, the fake news from social media. On one side, you have the government that needs to control, to monitor, and it's very hard to, to do this without making a sort of surveillance. On the other side, you have the companies themselves that they, they need to make business. And so propaganda or uh, advertising for them is quite the same things. They have, all, they have currently all the necessary information to try to analyze it, to discover specific components in, uh, in the behavior of some users that could, uh, could be attributed to a specific propaganda activities or, or the spreading of fake news. And, uh, uh, Tom, we started off uh, the program making mention of Ofcom, Ofcom, which is the regulatory body of uh, media in the UK. Established media organisations are signed up to codes of conduct, aren't they? Uh, codes of practice. Um, is the main problem, then, for the freelancer, the free wheeler, in fact, those that are not, uh, should, we, should we say, uh, new sources of information, citizen journalists, even? Well, just a quick comment about the use of the word fake news. I think that every time that we use it, we're actually doing the job of the people who want to undermine journalism and under, undermine the positive role that that can play in society. I think we need to be much more descriptive about are we talking about misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, what is the motivation behind it, and really kind of start to peel away uh, what we actually mean by all this various... Um, this whole spectrum of, of misinformation online and elsewhere, um, rather than actually undermining our own, uh, our own profession by, by doing so. Um, regulation works at three different levels. It works at the individual level, as me, as a journalist, what do I decide to publish? How do I treat my sources? Am I being independent? Am I being influenced by, by other actors? Am I showing humanity to the people that I'm talking about? Am I being accurate and fact-based in my communications? And we should be arguing for politicians and governments to be fact-based and, and, and not propagandists. But then you have the media level of how are we being accountable to our audiences? What are our codes of conduct? And then you have the industry level. 
I think it's unfair to paint freelancers uh, as 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 uneth unethical because they haven't signed up to perhaps a, a wider code of ethics. Some freelancers make that choice because they feel they can do better journalism outside of mainstream media rather than being inside where sometimes there are issues of self-censorship uh, and, and that kind of issue. So I think that we have to um, you know, not generalize about you know, uh, freelancers or even some citizen journalists or, or YouTubers. Some of them do some really good reporting and we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be kind of talked down to them and say, oh, well, you're not traditional media, you're not established. We need to have a very honest and open dialogue, admitting our own failings, but also trying to promote the best of what journalism can offer in terms of a framework of values for communication more widely. And uh, Mohammed, um, particularly in Western liberal democracies, there is a certain pride. Uh, they take a certain pride in an open media environment uh, where freedom of expression is encouraged and, and is tolerated. Um, but of course, things change for a government, for a country, when, for instance, they're at war or they feel that they're under attack. If their security is being threatened, that's when a completely different set of rules come into play. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And in fact, a lot of the uh, a lot of the research on the American news system, which uh, I work a lot with, um, shows that during times of crises, uh, disasters, and especially at times of war, um, the American news media tend to play a, a, a strong propaganda role. Right? This happened with the Iraq War. It happened uh, with the Vietnam War. If you want to go back some, you know, 40 plus years, uh, and you know, after 9/11, and and during a number of other uh, uh, crises. You know, what Tom said, I think, is very, very interesting and very important about the need to sort of define our terms. You know, are we talking about fake news or are we talking about propaganda? Are we talking about something else? I think fake news is very important, as I've illustrated, but I think it's important to point out the overwhelming majority of news stories that you're going to come across on a daily basis, if you open up the New York Times or The Guardian or whatever, they're not fake. They're not, you know, false stories, right? They're grounded in some reality. As a media scholar, I'm actually much more interested in other areas of journalism, other problems with, with journalism, if you will. Uh, I'm not sure if Tom would agree with me on that, but issues of, of media framing, issues of sourcing, uh, issues of implicit bias, right? Um, these are things that I've uh, worked on in my, my own research that I'm actually much more interested in than fake news. And uh, Pierre Luigi, uh, we, we've already asked the question, I asked the question specifically of Tom and he wasn't for it, but I was wondering whether you thought that the way forward uh, would be to introduce a greater, uh, uh, a greater framework of legislation. I don't believe that a great framework of regulation could help us. Here we have to agree on a specific uh, normal behaviour between states. Uh, that's my opinion, because I believe that also introducing a specific framework in a single state, uh, it will not give uh, any advantage. We need a shared agreement between the states. And this is also the result of uh, the effort that was spent during the last G7 uh, in, in Italy. We need normal behaviors between states in cyberspace. Right. Uh, OK, and Tom, the last word to you. I mean, you were... Uh, you were you were quite keen to, to for us to break down, if you like, the the language that we're using. Fake news. Fake news, incidentally, was apparently one of the most uh, uh, popular terms used for 2017. Um, but the fact is, journalists have long been uh, incorporated into campaigns of propaganda, or some might call it fake news. Um, it's down to the journalists then, is it, to, to impose upon themselves a certain level of, of uh, ethics uh, to which they, they, they should subscribe and live every day? Ideally, yes. We want journalists to be taking upon that responsibility to act ethically within their own value system, but also subscribe to codes of ethics whereby they can be held accountable. And we want to see the same done by media organisations themselves. And so the public can actually have a recourse and, and complain and ask for corrections if, if mistakes are made, absolutely. But we also need to have, uh, you know, Facebook and, and others taking their responsibilities much more seriously in terms of how their platforms operate and, and their transparency about what they allow and what they don't allow and how their algorithms work. If they don't do that, then laws will be introduced which could have very negative consequences. Much better that they voluntarily um, create for themselves 
better, more transparent, more accountable systems for the people who use their platforms and the readers and the audience for journalism to hold media to account. And that way, hopefully, we'll be able to address this issue of the trust deficit that we're currently um, faced with, and so people can choose better sources of information rather than uh, absorbing and consuming um, misinformation online. All right. Great stuff. Thank you all very much indeed. Tom Loring, Gdansk. Pierre Luigi Paganini in Naples and Mohamed El Masri here in Doha. Thank you all very much indeed. And as ever, thank you for watching the programme. If you want to see it again, you can go to the website, aljazeera.com. Should you want more discussion, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And there's the Twitter sphere, if you still trust it. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Martine Dennis, I'm at Martine Dennis. And the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.